All right, good morning, everybody. My name is Marco Argenti. I'm uh, responsible for Internet of Things and mobile at uh, AWS. And uh, I'm hoping you guys are as excited as I am uh, with uh, all the great things that uh, Werner has announced uh, just now, assuming that uh, a lot of you are, were at the keynote. Um, so really, really fantastic things that we've been there and uh, that are really made possible by the uh, great technology and products that uh, we're bringing to market uh, um, every day. And so I have an 11 years old uh, daughter and she knows that I'm kind of, she kind of knows what I'm doing and you know, she asked me, okay, that you know, we're launching this internet of things, so what is it actually? What does it do for me? And, and, and the thinking is like, what are we actually making possible for, for the, next gener the next generation of people that are gonna be uh, um, following us? And uh, what is really the promise of the internet of things on how it changes things that we do and we interact with every day? So I tried to give her a, a simple explanation of what this actually means. And, and it really boils down on a, uh, a few things that are made possible, such as uh, creating products that are smarter and they actually don't get older, they actually get better with time. So we kind of reverse the obsolescence uh, of, uh, of products. And it's about businesses that actually become uh, more efficient but also more predictable. You can count uh, on, uh, on your business because you have better data to make better decisions. And you're much closer to your customers. You have uh, a much closer relationship with people that are actually using your product and using your brand because you're able to actually be much closer to also what they do. And also do offerings that were just not possible before. Things that we dreamed of. And they're just not, uh, uh, like technology was not yet mature enough to make them possible. So that's the promise of Internet of Things, and we're seeing that actually starting to change the way companies operate and the way we uh, operate as customers. So um, just touching on a couple of things, like customers actually become creators or co-creators uh, of products. Uh, there's uh, an example of uh, uh, university students working with BMW to actually co-design the next car and then 3D printing parts of it for the prototypes. It's, uh, it's quite amazing. Your customer actually becomes the creator of the product. We used to uh, have a, a mediated experience, even with your computer. You used to actually touch something that will actually operate something virtualized on your computer, on your screen, which then will control something. So that's kind of a mediated experience. And then we kind of tried to simulate reality by putting you know, things that you could touch, glass that you could touch, the touch screen, where you had simulated interfaces with you know, virtual buttons and things you can pop up and down and turn and twist. And today you actually <laughs> touch the product itself, being that a toothbrush or a can or, a, or, 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 or a, you know, and in this case it's like a, a connected scale, which has a little, measure that just appears and then you can just touch it to, to operate it and to do other functions. So the product is actually becoming the interface. Interestingly enough, product and industrial design and UX design are actually colliding. Today, if you're studying, if you're like my daughter, you wanna start, you know, you wanna study industrial design, well, you better know about user interface. You better know about uh, how computer works and, 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 and technology works and, and products connect with each other. So it's really fascinating. Communication is happening in a very natural way. Actually, immediately, people are like, uh, attracted like, to the most natural experience, like it happened with touch screens. It was so natural that immediately everybody switched to that because it was so natural to do. And what's even more natural than touching glass? It's actually speaking. Like voice is the way we communicate. And of course, you know, Echo has been a, a tremendous success and, you know, it's really becoming a part of the family. It's becoming, you know, a, a companion to our house. And, uh, you know, my daughter asks, uh, uh, you know, to Alexa to tell her a joke, but now she can also turn on and off the lights in the house. And if Alexa doesn't understand something, she's asking, do you mean this or do you mean that? So uh, my mother actually f from Italy was, uh, was visiting. And then when she left, <laughs> she actually said hello to Alexa. And she was, a, you know, a little bit uh, um, disappointed she didn't call her back by name. But uh, it, it's really so, so natural. And we'll see a great example later on of how this actually applies also to 
the evolution of uh, industrial use cases, uh, uh, such as in healthcare, for example, uh, or anything that, uh, um, let's say, um, any task where you have your hands occupied, the most, uh, one of the most used tasks in Alexa is actually setting the timer. Because you know, if you're boiling pasta or if you have your hands occupied, you definitely don't want to drop it for, uh, uh, bless you, for uh, um, uh, controlling your timer. So really taking uh, the interaction with products uh, to the most natural way, which is I'm actually touching a product if I want to interact with it. I'm actually talking to uh, um, a user interface and, and exp explaining things rather than trying to simulate uh, and touch a, a simulated interface. That's, it's really, really fascinating. However, making this possible in a, in, in a simple and natural way requires a lot of work from a technology standpoint. Those things are just becoming possible. And still today, Lots of customers need to do a lot of work in order to actually activate uh, and, and, and enable the use, use cases that I just talked about. Devices are very hard to connect and manage. They're very diverse, they're very uh, small, they're power constrained, they're on batteries, they're on several different networks. It takes work in order to actually uh, enable them and, and, and connect them and make them talk to each other. And things also for customers don't necessarily oper interoperate out of the box. You, you buy something really cool that you read on a, on a, on a website, and then you go and buy it on, a, on Amazon, and, uh, and then you, you, know, you need to configure that at home. And, and you know, it, it just needs to be as simple as when you order a Kindle. You know, it comes pre-configured. So how do we make that uh, easier for the customer? Everybody's telling companies you know, to start instrumenting their processes and also their uh, devices, putting sensors uh, uh, everywhere. And then all of a sudden, they go from no data whatsoever to too much data. And, and, and the signal to noise ratio is actually becoming uh, uh, quite low because you just don't know what to do with the data. Like uh, connecting a device is not by itself value add. You actually need to know what to do with the data and which data is actually something that is relevant for you. And then there's this whole world of uh, uh, devices that has evolved from what we used to call machine to machine uh, to telemetry to uh, you know, use cases that are about connecting sensors and they really like to talk in a messaging paradigm. And then on the other side, you have this whole new world of applications, especially mobile applications, uh, web applications, that really like to talk another language, which is the language of the web and which is the language of RESTful uh, uh, APIs and, uh, and, and, and persistent endpoints and, and, and so forth. And how do we make those worlds actually uh, work together? So today we announced uh, AWS IoT, which is really a platform uh, with a series of uh, uh, components that are really designed to make uh, that undifferentiating heavy lifting of uh, connecting and managing devices and also extracting value from the data, something that is really easy and really out of the box and is offered as a, as a managed service, meaning that you don't even have to worry about instances or, or servers, it just scales with you. And really, AWS IoT tries to attack this problem uh, into three main areas, offering specific functionality for three main areas, which uh, are first and foremost uh, securely connecting and managing physical devices across uh, multiple networks and protocols. We really want to abstract uh, uh, what protocols or what network uh, device is on or what protocol is using. We just want to make it uh, uh, something that can uh, appear to an application really like uh, a single uh, endpoint that you can talk to, that you can reach uh, uh, very, very easily. And, and also create a common language between devices. Also, once the data start flowing in, providing uh, uh, a rule engine and also uh, uh, you know, the ability to insert a lambda, uh, trigger a lambda function in any uh, node of the uh, F messaging fabric uh, underlying so that you can filter, you can select, you can reduce, uh, you can compress, you can reroute messages. So you can actually act uh, on this uh, giant switchboard uh, of messages coming from millions of devices or hundreds of devices or how many devices you have in a way that is uh, predictable and it's also easy to change so that you don't have to reprogram the device every time you want to actually make a change to how the devices talk to each other. And the third point is really bridging those two um, 
worlds of messaging and, uh, and, and uh, ephemeral uh, uh, communication, message-based ephemeral communication with persistent restful endpoints. And that's what Device Shadow does, basically giving you the ability to not worry about how to reach a device and just being able to set a desired state through a REST API. And then we take care of how to talk to the device. So those are like the three um, uh, main areas that uh, really this announcement is about. So trying to get, I'm trying to get a little bit more and more details as we go through this presentation, but think about it, uh, you know, we make it easy to connect and also make it easy to connect different devices so that they appear all like, like the same type of devices and then, uh, you know, making it easy to filter and extract data and making it also easy to create applications. There are single components that I'm going to talk about, uh, but first I actually want to talk about how this actually is, is becoming possible already today with uh, great companies doing uh, fantastic work on AWS to really enable some of the uh, promise of the, um, of the uh, Internet of Things. And we really have customers that are uh, uh, connecting physical things uh, in the cloud uh, in pretty much every uh, industry uh, imaginable. So uh, going from uh, um, you know, smart homes and infrastructures and smart cities. You've seen some of those examples in Werner's keynote. And healthcare, of course, is uh, uh, an incredibly important uh, uh, industry vertical that is being disrupted right now and so meaningful to us because it's about us, it's about our health, it's about the health of our children. And Philips has been a, a great partner of, uh, of AWS uh, all along. Philips is uh, uh, an innovator, a leading health, uh, health uh, technology company that uh, is really some of the numbers are, are, are staggering. So um, it's really in this new era of kind of managing healthcare, uh, they already connect uh, uh, in like uh, 7 million uh, devices uh, to, to the cloud and they uh, manage uh, uh, over uh, over uh, 15 uh, petabyte of data that comes from uh, uh, imaging uh, and, and you know 250 million pa patients that are uh, that are monitored so really coming together as a team uh, around the person with a team that is able to share data to be able to provide better care and for that I'm proud uh, to have uh, Juran Tas, who is the CEO of uh, Philips Healthcare Informatics with me today. So Michael, please hi. come to the stage. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. So I'm very proud to be here because uh, I think Amazon Web Services is absolutely the greatest technology company in the world. And you've heard something about uh, the amounts that, of data that we're talking about. But when we talk about the Internet of Things, we're actually talking about the Internet of Things and people because the things only matter in the context of what you need in everyday life. And for us, that's very important because our mission is to provide ca better care, better health for people around the globe. Our mission is to make sure that half of the population of the United States who suffer from a chronic condition, who have care teams that need to help them, really have that information at their fingertips to help these people healthier and better lives. So I think it's a great mission. And we see, uh, actually, that we're at, uh, at uh, the dawn of a new age in healthcare. Because healthcare used to be such that you have a problem, you go to your general practitioner, and then, uh, if it's really serious, you go to the hospital. So it's organized around acute care. But now, if we're talking about chronic disease, which represent 80% of all the healthcare costs, it's really about every day. It's about continuous. It's sometimes mission critical. So if we see that somebody is deteriorating rapidly, can we proactively provide the care? Can we rush them to the hospital and have all information relevant to them there at the point of care so that we make the right diagnosis and treatment? And it still happens, it still doesn't happen today. So we believe this technology and applying it at scale will have a huge impact on all of us, on you, because all of you will have a story. Either you suffer yourself from a condition or your parents do, or your kid, like my, uh, Marco talks about his daughter. My daughter um, has type 1 juvenile diabetes. She has to measure her, her, her blood uh, sugars every day. She has to take insulin. She has to watch her activity, understand uh, whether she's stressful or not, because it's all really relevant on her everyday care. But also my dad and probably your dad or grandparents, they need help if they want to live at home 
as they get older. And I think this is a good example of how we bring together all that information because today none of your healthcare data is aggregated. None of it is normalized and none of it is actually available as and when needed. So we're looking at combining the data from your own personal engagement, you know, connecting devices like glucose meters, like heart rate meters, like blood pressure meters, like SpO2 meters for people with COPD. But that's not enough, because capturing the data only makes sense if you give it context, if you give it the context of who you are, what your condition is, and the care you require. So we need to make sure that we can coordinate that properly, because if you have type 1 diabetes, you also need the, a dermatologist to help you because you may have complications with skin, you may have complications with liver, you may have uh, issues with what you eat, so you may have a nutritionist. So how can we bring that together in a team and use technology to stream the data to those folks and then use analytical engines from that streaming data, combining that with a patient profile to determine whether you need an intervention whether you're actually taking your medication and therefore somebody needs to call you up. Um, whether you have the right information about, you know, a cancer, so that we can bring that into our analysis environment where we not only look at images and create a 3D model of that cancer, we can also use deep learning to identify whether that cancer is actually malignant or not. And then apply the right therapy through genomics. And you heard Werner talk about genomics Genomic data is really important in determining, for instance, whether chemotherapy will work for you. So this is a really exciting space that we're doing together with Amazon Web Services on our Health Suite digital platform. Now this is an elderly person, actually the dad of uh, a colleague of mine sitting here, who has multiple chronic diseases and living at home. So he is bound to, um, to fall, he is bound to deteriorate if we don't track him. So he wears this pendant, and this pendant is actually teetering him 24-7 with a care team. They can see um, his blood pressure, all of that will be streamed up and he will have the tools to control that. So he's in charge of his own health, but he's backed up by a real-time care team that will analyze the data. So, this device can always be pressed 24 by 7, but it will be linked also to the sensors that we placed into that home. Because we want to know when he goes to bed, when he gets up in the middle of the night to go to the restroom, the lights will come up because most people fall actually when the lights are off. So there we're using our u lamps. But every time we're tracking what he's doing. So we can see if everything is normal, it's fine when we see a deterioration, when we see him going to the restroom 10 times a night, when we see him not opening that fridge in the morning, when we see him getting up more slowly through this device, we see that he's impacted. But now he's using also the echo device to see whether he should take his medication. He's actually communicating directly with our medication device, which will tell him, don't worry, in two minutes I will actually dispense the right medication. And if he's not taking that medication, an alert will go to his care team. And that might be his son, Joost, who's sitting here, who will call him up and say, Dad, you didn't take your medication. And you know 50% of the people don't take their medication. So what we're doing here is we're truly helping people care for themselves, but be 24-7 backed up by a team, which can include your kids, to help you live with dignity when you get older. So how do we do that? We connect all these sensors and devices, blood pressure cuff, um, this, this device, which is actually a mobile, um, the echo device, because we believe that will be the interface of the future, the ULAMs, and it's all streaming data all the time into the cloud. Now, most of that data will not prompt an action because everything is all right, but Many times we need an intervention because we see that deterioration or we see an alert and then we need to have that nugget of information to actually send an ambulance at the right time before somebody gets a heart attack. So now we can see a heart attack coming and we can treat it with medication rather than wait for somebody to die on the way to um, the hospital. So what we're doing with our Health Suite digital platform that we actually deploy on AWS because we're looking at very, very, very high amounts of data, which, 
what I call white data, all the data that we capture over time from all, all these devices, and really deep data, because through digital pathology and imaging, we can get down to the cell level, and we can look at that cancer and analyze that cancer. So we're putting all that information together, sometimes up to a terabyte per patient, and bring that together for the care team. So we think that the Internet of Things is an Internet of Things and people because it will be at the service of people living with dignity at home, getting the care they need at the right time, at the right time, place. And we will see that life will become much easier because many of this will be voice driven through echo. And that will not only be in the home of an elderly person, it will be on the desk of your general practitioner. So they don't need to spend half of their time entering data into their medical records. Now lastly, we believe this is only gonna work if you truly have a scalable infrastructure, if you can stream the data and interpret those data in real time, if you can mesh it up with other data, like a medical record, a profile of a patient. And we believe there's only one company in the entire world that has the infrastructure, the software capability, the data capability to enable this. And we're very proud to do this together with Amazon Web Services. And we're a great supporter of their IoT platform. We're going to hook up our already 7 million devices, but we're scaling up to hundreds of millions of sensors and devices because that's what it takes to make this a healthier world. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Wow. It's very hard to actually add anything after that, but. Uh, um, Internet of Things and people, and, uh, and, and this theme that actually data helps us understand uh, more about people. The increased value of a product over time is really a fascinating concept because uh, the product can now do things that uh, it wasn't even designed for because of the capabilities that actually connected product brings. Uh, and because of the ability to analyze patterns, to tune up a product, or to even update a product with things that were not even thought of at the moment of design. It's an interesting pattern because uh, with AWS IoT, we can uh, observe uh, uh, and ingest uh, uh, telemetry data around the environment, around the product itself. We can filter the data and then uh, uh, spawn essentially two processes, one for in-depth analysis, storing data through Kinesis into uh, DynamoDB or into Redshift and really trying to do a bit of a longer term analysis of the uh, way we can improve a product, or feeding right through and from the Kinesis stream and getting real-time uh, uh, analytics for real-time product optimization, such as, for example, listening to how a room sounds and actually optimizing the speakers for it. So those are patterns that we're starting to see. And uh, to talk about this, I have a uh, great pleasure to have uh, with me John Cotter from uh, Sonos, who's obviously like a leading company in delivering a personalized uh, uh, music experience in the home. Thank you, John. Yeah. How are you doing? So for starters, how many Sonos owners do we have in the house tonight? Today, sorry. All right, that's a good number. Um, so for those of you who do not know Sonos, we make connected home audio equipment. Um, we founded in 2002, shipped our first product, connected product in 2006, um, shipped our first smart speaker in 2009, which was the previous generation of this. So what you're looking at here is the New Play 5, which will be released later this year, and it was just announced a couple weeks ago. Um, so the old Play 5 came out in 2009. The new Play 5 comes out in 2016, uh, 2015. There's a you know, six-year gap there between products. So one of the things about a connected product is it improves over time. So if you bought your uh, Play 5 in 2009, it, it supported six services. Um, the same Play 5 can be upgraded today and supports over 60 services. Many services which didn't exist when the, the product was actually being built and planned. Um, and that's something that only a, a connected product can do. Um, in addition to that, that allows us to keep pace 
with an industry that is changing extremely rapidly. So, you know, music streaming is, is taking over. Um, and it allows us to see into things and, and see un unique insights that only Sonos has. So we have this sort of 10 year history. We have millions of customers all over the world listening to music. And for those of you who have opted into sharing usage data with us, we have aggregated usage on sort of when you listen to, what services you listen to, um, and what time of day. And, and that gives us a perspective sort of regionally um, and to understand the industry and see how people really are listening and streaming music as their primary source of, of music listening at home. Um, and this is all made possible through AWS and Kinesis for a large part. Um, this is what our data pipeline looks like, our analytics pipeline. We use uh, AWS in, in a number of places and I'm just gonna concentrate on the data pipeline for now. Um, we have small EC2 instances, which we use for a data collector, and we keep those as close to the product as possible to minimize latency, because the goal is to keep the music playing um, and not interrupt that. Kinesis provides us a very scalable ingestion engine um, that we can just throw data at without, without worrying about it. Goes through a small gatekeeper app in our storage service and then gets stored securely in S3. Um, and then we have a number of processes that come up and, and basically ETL, take the data and put it into whatever source it needs to be, either a reporting app, data warehouse, visualization, ad hoc report, wherever it needs to go. Um, and basically because each server scales independently, we can optimize for cost, durability, sort of whatever we need to along the way. Um, finally, sorry. So finally, because these are decoupled, as AWS uh, comes out with new products, new services, we can just drop them in and test them. Um, so Spark, I mean, there were some new announcements for Kinesis the last couple of days. Uh, you know, very excited to take advantage of those. And additionally, so we usually see data land in S3 within about five minutes, right? And that works great for reporting apps and things like that. Um, but what if you don't want to wait five minutes, right? So Kinesis also offers streaming. Uh, as an example of this, our ops team wanted to measure telemetry data across the globe to measure the health of services and players all over the world. Um, and in order to enable that, we just gave them access into the Kinesis stream. And within a day, they had access to all the data that they needed to do their job. We didn't have to lift a finger. Um, it's great for us, great for them. So just a couple notes about Kinesis. When we switched to it, the scale aspect, it, you know, facilitated a massive increase of our data uh, capture ability overnight. We we're able to capture a wide variety of, of payloads, um, durable, secure. Sort of the, one of the main things though is that because scale isn't much of an issue for us anymore, I don't have to babysit the pipeline, uh, it's freed up developers just to add data to the apps. The bug comes in, they take a look at it, they instrument it, get a build out, they're looking at data within hours. And again, we haven't had to do a thing. Um, so those are incremental changes, right? And I, I would argue that that's expected, right? If you're, if you're buying any sort of connected product, you should expect it to get better with time. So I want to talk about a few things that I've been involved in at Sonos in a data capacity um, that sort of pushed beyond that incremental change. And, and one of them was, so for anyone who had the product prior to 2014, you remember that you had to physically plug in at least one part at least one device, right? It had, to be t it had to be connected to your network, usually via Ethernet, and usually there was a product called a bridge that we would sell. It's basically like a small little Sonos router. That was your first point of entry. So in 2014, with the simple software update, we removed that need. So you could get started with Sonos just by connecting wirelessly to your, your Wi-Fi network. Um, and we were able to do this by analyzing mountains of usage data, um, we ran the largest beta in the company's history, tens of thousands of people, um, and, and really wanted to make sure that, that we could sort of take this scary step of removing that physical connection um, and have it work to this, the standard that we believed in. And this change fundamentally changed the way people get started with Sonos. You, you, you start for $50 less. You didn't have to understand you know, various parts of your network. You could just get in, get started, click a few buttons, and there you go, you're going. Um, so that was 2014. So most recently, I think I have, okay, here we go. 
So this is an announcement that just came out a couple weeks ago. Um, and this is True Play. And what this is, is basically adjusting for is the acoustics of every room are completely different, right? So when you put your speaker somewhere, the sound that's coming out of it is largely governed by the room that it's in. Just wait a couple seconds for it to finish up here. So here you go, smart speakers that tune to your home. So by using your phone, by using the microphone in your phone, you play test tones out of your speaker, it calibrates the speaker to adjust for the sounds in your room. Right. So that's really cool right in and of itself. I think the part that's particularly cool is that even though this was launching and was developed in the last couple of years, it's actually available to that same Play 5 that you purchased in 2009. So there's a you know, quantum leaps forward in design and evolution of the product. And again, data-driven evaluation. We're actually changing the way the speaker sounds. So we wanted to make sure that, well, it did actually sound better and the perceptions sounded better. And again, using our Kinesis pipeline, it was very easy just to create tests and let, people, let the engineers run with it. And if they needed to add a new metric, you know, I didn't have to care like, hey, how much data are you adding? So just like connected speakers, getting better with time. I would also argue that AWS gets better with time. So you just look at the announcements for the last couple of days, there's a lot of new things to play with. And I mean, I've got a really fun job. Um, these are basically like new toys for me. Um, this, this, a, this AOS IoT um, infrastructure is, looks really cool. Uh, the new Kinesis Firehose service that fits perfectly into the pipeline I showed you earlier. This new S3 storage tier, S3 storage tier that they announced is the sort of save it for later tier. This is perfect for, you know, we do we manufacture and design our own products, so that we do a lot of hardware quality data, and you don't necessarily look at that every day. So there's a lot of stuff we can grab, store it for later, bring it back up when we want, far more cost effectively than before. And they're constantly adding new services: machine learning, Elasticsearch, Spark as a service. And um, yeah, that makes my job a lot more fun. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. So really looking forward to some of my products to get older <laughs> so they can get better. But that's really uh, one of the most disruptive uh, changes that IoT is actually bringing uh, to the table. So let's take a look a little bit on how this AWS IoT product actually works. So um, we talked about the problem of connecting devices. So at, at the center of the product, uh, and really the front door, is the device gateway, which allows devices of any kind to talk different protocols. We support MQTT, we support HTTP, and uh, we support also, also your own custom protocols that you, can that you can create and then connect to uh, device gateway. And that's really the layer where all the devices become equal. It's the equal equalizer where basically we are allowing you to send messages to a device or receive messages from a device independently of their protocol. Um, the device SDK is uh, uh, basically what physically goes on the, uh, on the unit. And it's actually something that you don't need to necessarily uh, use because you can use your own uh, uh, client to connect uh, to, as long as you can speak HTTP or you can speak MQTT, so it's really, really easy to connect. But if you want to make it even easier, we give you uh, a device SDK and some of the hardware manufacturers like we're going to see in, in, in a minute and some of the boxes that you see here are great products from great leading component manufacturers that already come uh, pre-configured and pre-connected uh, with the device SDK. Authentication, security is really the number one priority and for IoT when it's about people and it's about lives, uh, you know, it's, it's really the priority number one like it's ever been for AWS. And so, we support uh, and we enforce actually TLS uh, uh, mutual authentication, so communication is encrypted and it's actually secure end to end. We're going to see a little bit more of that in detail uh, later on. And once the data comes in, the rules engine really allows you to put a probe in the flow of data and then do operations such as uh, filtering, routing, storing data. And you can connect and you can route that data directly into uh, several AWS services that are relevant, such as Kinesis, such as DynamoDB, such as uh, SNS, such as S3, 
So you can really take this flow of data, filter it with a rule, and then actually send it to another AWS service where you can consume that, including, for example, machine learning uh, services. The shadow is how applications actually communicate uh, with uh, devices, even without knowing how the, what, what language the device talks, and also whether the device is online or not. The shadow will report uh, the latest state from a device, will allow you as an application uh, to ask for a specific state, like change the lights uh, to red or, to, or, or, or open or close a garage door. And then, uh, essentially, uh, you know, I, AWS IoT will know how to reach the device and will know how to talk to the device to send that command. And will communicate the, the state back to the application, say now the state that you desired and the state that is actually reported are finally the same. And so then you can uh, display something on the user interface. Um, the uh, control plane, we call it internally, but really all the APIs of AWS IoT are RESTful APIs. They're exposed uh, you know, to applications. Uh, and, and, and they're also uh, pushed to the edge. Uh, so we leverage CloudFront to create CloudFront distribution. So your AWS uh, control APIs are actually as close to the device as possible. And that's something that we believe is very important. It's going to be increasingly important for uh, low latency applications. And then finally, for to make it even easier for people and for applications to understand what a device is or what a device does, we have a device registry, which is a place where a device can register themselves. We automatically register uh, devices when you create them, and then you can add attributes such as, is this device a thermostat? And uh, is the ter temperature reported in Fahrenheit? Uh, and uh, you know, what kind of uh, 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 capabilities does this device have? And I can match, essentially I can retrieve the device capabilities from the registry by basically querying by device ID. So I can really make sense of all the data that flows through the system in a very, very simple way. I talked about uh, uh, the multi-protocol aspect. Uh, um, we have uh, uh, customers today, you know, through our acquisition uh, of, uh, of telemetry and also in the private beta that are using MQTT today for things like uh, 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 monitoring trucks uh, uh, for uh, driver compliance uh, or uh, uh, like we're going to see uh, very, uh, very shortly for uh, uh, replenishment services for all kinds of uh, uh, applications that really need uh, a lot of data at large scale. And the MQTT is an ideal protocol because it's small, it's lightweight, it's message-based. It doesn't really require too much uh, work uh, from the device, and also it doesn't consume important network resources that uh, you know, sometimes can be expensive, especially if you're collecting through uh, cellular. We uh, uh, implement a PubSub mechanism, which is working basically both in a fan-out fashion and a fan-in fashion, meaning that uh, uh, if I'm a device, I can publish to a channel, almost like a chat, and then uh, any other device, if it has the permission, can listen to that, cha to that uh, channel. I don't even need to know that they're listening, and they can actually uh, communicate with me, even with different protocols. And then I can also subscribe to a channel, so basically I'm getting all the messages that uh, uh, that channel receives, or I can create a rule or subscribe to the topic that is above that channel, so I can listen, for example, to uh, you know, communication on a single device, on a group of devices, on a fleet of devices, an entire building, an entire city, depending on the permission that are set uh, by, the, by, the, uh, by the application developer and the administration. And also the certificate-based uh, uh, authentication, we support uh, X509 certs and, and TLS 1.2 will mute a lot, which we really think uh, you know, it's an essential component to making sure that your system is secure. Um, I talked about the registry. Um, I think I like the interaction between uh, registry, shadow, and rules, because that's really how applications can instruct AWS uh, IoT to do things. You see a message from a device. You can check on the registry what the device is and what it does, and what this message means. Is that Fahrenheit Celsius? Is it pressure in, uh, in which unit of measure? Is it metric? Is it imperial? And then uh, 
you can take action with a rule which is uh, uh, essentially expressed like a SQL statement that can uh, work on that payload or trigger a lambda function if you want to have a more complex processing of that. And we work on a time window, so we do stream processing of the data, so it's really powerful functionality. And then we make that available to application with single uh, RESTful endpoints for each device that you can query and you can also ask to change state through the same API. So really, really powerful how this all comes uh, together. I really like this uh, uh, you know, enforcement of security and policies end to end because uh, it doesn't really help me when I have billions of devices uh, to, to have uh, you know, various places where I set permissions uh, for what a device can do or what data can it access or who can actually access that data. And uh, it, it might become a management nightmare. So what we did, we extended the IAM uh, uh, model of uh, uh, role-based uh, uh, authentication and authorization all the way down to the device and actually through the message broker so that uh, you can uh, create a policy that tells exactly what that, what, can, what that device can do, which data sources can access and where the message can actually be routed to. So it's a really, really granular permission and you can uh, describe actually the single ARN for each of the devices. Associate, and then uh, we can associate a policy to a certificate. So at that point, from that point onwards, every time there is a connection authenticated with a certificate, we enforce that policy. And we enforce that policy throughout, uh, including using the same policy within uh, AWS IoT and also within the underlying AWS services, such as, for example, uh, uh, DynamoDB. So you really have a chain of trust. You really have end-to-end -end, uh, policy management. You really have rich functionality for device management, which I think are absolutely essential if you want to do a IoT at scale. And so your ability to manage devices, to orchestrate devices, uh, you know, it really translates uh, in processes, in business processes that uh, are, uh, you know, they give more predictability and more efficiency and ultimately less waste uh, uh, also from a, from a Six Sigma pers lean perspective. So you're actually becoming a more profitable company, or you can. And, uh, uh, you know, the example of an array of temperature sensor transmitting telemetry data, getting into AWS IoT that filters that data sends the sensor data to Kinesis, uh, for, uh, uh, through Kinesis to uh, a data warehouse for analysis. If an anomaly is detected, a lambda function can trigger and then send a notification to an operator, and then at the same time send a control to a device, for example, to put itself uh, into standby or so that uh, you, know, you might prevent uh, further manage or going into maintenance mode. So it's really this data-driven orchestration of actions, both towards humans and throughout device that happens uh, in real time through the rule engine and through Lambda, is something that is, uh, I think, pretty fascinating. So at the end of the day, you can have uh, a more efficiently run organization with less costs uh, and uh, you know, essentially a better service to your customers. I'm actually really excited. You might have seen, uh, if you, especially if you've shaken a lot of hands during this conference, you might have seen uh, that there are actually like uh, dispensers throughout. Uh, and those sealed air dispensers are actually uh, powered by, by AWS IoT today. You know, they were one of the key partners in, in our private beta. And uh, you, know, you uh, might know uh, sealed air probably most for you know, their greatest, I think possibly the greatest invention uh, ever, which is a bubble wrap. So bubble wrap was invest invented by steel, seal air, that's why it's called sealed air. And I really wish that they could pop more and more and not less and less because it's really frustrating if they do. But diversity uh, uh, and, and sealed air and, uh, and, and uh, diversity care are really like a world the global leader in, uh, in, in food safety, in uh, uh, infection pre prevention, in facility hygiene and uh, that's really helping all of us actually have a better life and in fact actually uh, prevent some of the diseases that we were talking about before. So again, it boils down to really, really practical advantages. So I'm extremely excited to have uh, Dr. Uh, Ilham Kadri here with President of Diversity Care to talk to us about uh, all the fascinating things that they're doing with AWS IoT. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marco. By the way, I count on Amazon to pop uh, more bubble wraps, right, uh, Marco? <laughs>
Um, so let me get this right, yeah. Well, it's a real privilege and honor to be with you today. Thanks to Amazon, AWS for having me. Um, so may maybe have uh, an de-icing moment. Let's get to know your neighbor, right? Look at them, they look smart. Shake their hands, please. Let's do that, all of us. Just shake their hands, unless your culture doesn't allow you to do that, right? Yeah, great, all right, all right. Now, if you tell you that the person whose hand you just shook didn't wash their hands in the toilet, oh, there is a person saying, you don't look pretty anymore, <laughs> be nice. So joke aside, four out of five people globally do not wash their hands in the toilet. And this has to, nothing to do with running water or having a toilet at home, right? It has nothing to do. And why I'm telling you that is because washing our hands is actually preventing diarrhea, flu, other diseases like Ebola. As simple as washing our hands is actually helping us to have a healthier and a better clean, cleaning uh, future. It's funny that all the speakers actually, they, taught, they, they talked about their kids, and I'm gonna do the same. I have uh, a Generation Z at home, a proud mother of my son, he's nine, and IoT is part of him. It's part of his mind, of his body. He's multitasking, he's buying his games from Amazon, asking me to pay the bills, obviously. But it's fascinating to see how they can use it naturally, as Marco said. Easily. He is a digital native. I am a digital immigrant. And we all need to adapt and adopt IoT for a simple reason that if you don't do so, you will have what I call the Kodak moment. You may remember Kodak? Yeah. They missed the digital wave in photography. They thought they were a paper company, a paper photographer. They struggled, they missed it. IoT is about connecting 26 billion devices by 2020. This is going to represent $1.9 trillion economy, a growth opportunity for all of us. And that's why we are here. We don't want to miss that. We cannot ignore it. IoT will be impacting my industry, the cleaning industry, in a way that you have never imagined. It will revolutionize the way we clean, but also the way we measure the outcome. The problem with cleanliness is that you don't see it. You see it when it's dirty, therefore it's too late, right? I was truly shocked when I joined this industry how little IoT is adopted in my industry. Unlike other industries I worked in, like automotive, aerospace, marine, or the chemical manufacturing. So let's look at, at Africa. I was born in the beautiful city of Casablanca in Morocco. And there, we're still at the mop and the bucket age. So we still, actually they clean with water, they don't even buy sometimes disinfectant or soap. It's not good for my business. What is interesting is that they are in the mop age, but they have smart devices, right? They have phones at home, they have smart tablets. And sometimes they don't have even a working toilet. Let's look closer to our home in the US where you can pretend that we are having, we have the best standards in hygiene and cleaning on earth. Do you know that in the US alone about 2 million people suffer from the health acquired infection, HII. You enter into the hospital, you are safe and healthy and you catch an infection inside the hospital. This is costing the US $33 billion every year. Absenteeism is costing $226 billion to the, to the American economy. 7.7 .7 days of sickness every year, every employee. More than that, did you know that one in six people is food poisoned in the US? And the first reason of food poisoning, you know what is it? Tell me. Lack of hand hygiene. Exactly. It's a pure loss of productivity, pure loss of money, we're wasting money. And it's all about actually addressing the most pressing issues on earth for humanity. It's just like there is no life without water, there is no sustainable life without hygiene and cleaning. My industry, the cleaning industry is employing 800 million people around the world. 
Many of them are illiterate or they don't speak the native language. In some verticals like the building service contractors industry, people who are cleaning your offices, you can, they face as much as 70% of human capital turnover. You can imagine your corporations and firms turning into experimental training lab every time, every day. Imagine 800 people with a smart device just one by body. You are going to connect billions of devices, connecting billion or trillion of sensors. They may be cleaning with a mop and a bucket, but we can tap into the connectivity. It's just amazing. And we had a dream. I had a dream. I had a dream with my team of arming our customers with smart data, with smart insights, just when they need them, with smart services. We wanted to reimagine and reinvent a commodity. We want to reinvent, you know, the Uber of taxis or Nespresso of coffee. I'm a coffee lover, so I love that as well. Our job yesterday was about selling and invoicing chemicals. That was our job. Today, it's not anymore true. Our job, it can be that we invoice chemicals and we sell machines, but we are selling food safety. We are protecting lives in, in hospitals. We are protecting your kids. We are allowing you to have more labor productivity. And in, in a moment of inspiration, we invented the Internet of Clean. Our things is clean, right? The Internet of Clean is going to help us to make the invisible visible. It will restore the value of clean. The true value of clean, which is about protecting people, helping hospitals to decrease the health acquired infection, save water and energy, get your labor productivity down, train your people remotely. The Internet of Things and Internet of Clean will protect you, your kids, your assets, and transform the cleaning industry in a way that we didn't expect. This is the architecture of the Internet of Clean. We have created a new platform with our partners, AWS, connecting machine dispensers, beacons, smart devices, plug and play, whatever you have. Think of a supermarket. Think about your hotel room today. Think about a retail store. You can start actually connecting all the smart cleaning devices and you, you start to become predictive, proactive rather than reactive. We start to become relevant to our, to our customers and their customers, giving them insights when they need them. As an example, Marco talked about temperature monitoring. We have that. This is an RFID, cloud-based. It actually tracks the location and the food conditions. We saved 400 tons of food waste per year per retail store. Per year per retail store. Do the math. SmartView via an integrated cloud platform. SmartView is tracking employees' activities in 7,000 buildings in 12 countries around the world just a few months after we launched it. It gives the users complete visibility of information what your people are doing, what they should be doing. They talk to their managers, to their supervisors, to their colleagues. They troubleshoot. They use augmented reality, as you can see. It can be glasses, it can be smart devices. All of this cloud-based. Our machines, they used to be manual. They are intelligent today. They tell us how much water, how much energy they are using. Who is using them? If your employees need training because they are crashing the machines against, against the wall every time, it alerts you and do preventive maintenance just like, like your cars. It manages your fleet if you have huge investments in such machines in an airport. It makes the cleaner more pride to be a cleaner because very few here have ever dreamed of becoming a cleaner. I could not have imagined buying a robotic company and artificial intelligence when coming to the cleaning industry. This is our new employee, Mr. Robot Cleaner. Hands free. It works 24-7 during the night. It, tell, it tells us how much utilities he's using. It tells us if the batteries are going to shut down. It helps our customers to boost their productivity saving on labor 
and using up to 85% less water and chemicals. In some areas around the world where salaries are high, the cost of labor is high, like in Australia, where wages inflation is high, or maybe labor is scarce because we don't find the cleaners, believe it or not, in Russia or in Australia. The return in investment of such technology is less than one year. The operation managers are truly proud of this now because information is power. But data analytics and insights are making them winning because they can anticipate where their customers want. They know where the machines are. We just produced our number uh, 200 robot yesterday. Extremely proud of that. We can see them like any, any fleet. And the last but not the least, extremely proud of our hand soap dispenser, the soft care. You can just see it outside the room. And remember the outcome. It's about saving lives, improving the food poisoning or stopping it, decreasing the, the hospital acquired infections. And it's actually a great, great technology in, uh, in the cruise industry for preventing outbreaks. It helps us actually to, to know how much volumes is still available in the hand soap. So it's great for food safety prevention. Let's think about a daily hub in a retail store. Or for customer satisfaction, just simple as that. When you are in five-star hotel, you don't want to see your hand dispenser empty, right? So it's going to never run out of soap. With our partner AWS and other partners, we've actually developed this dashboard. And you can see that you can look at the sanitizer level online, 24-7. And what we missed is the fulfillment. And here we are with the dash replenishment services. Outstanding. We have now connected smart devices and hand soap smart devices all together. And they can themselves replenish. They can make automatic orders. And you can just bring the right pouch at the right time into the hand soap dispenser. You can have it through the prime delivery, less than 20, 48 hours, right? Through Amazon. That's just outstanding. It's revolutionary in our business, really revolutionary. And it's not, it's not about cleaning hands, it's about saving lives. So that's the platform. We can have a plug and play. You can actually design reporting tools and build customer portals, which are telling to the customer exactly what they want and customize it to the job. The VP quality is interested by food safety quality KPIs. The store manager is interested by labor productivity. And the CEO is interested by compliance. And he want to ensure that his brand is protected because there his guests are protected. And the sky is the limit. Me, as, as a business leader for the Internet of Clean, I look at few values and attributes from my partners. I look at speed, quality, agility, ingenuity. I look at global scale. I look at security, adaptability. I look at trust. And that's what we got with AWS. We put all this together. And the beauty is that we started pushing new business models. We moved from being a commodity player to actually becoming a specialty player in our industry. We are not selling soaps anymore. We are selling food safety, labor productivity, food hygiene, food waste, decreasing food waste. It helps us in our transformation to become that knowledge company we want to belong to. We want to give our customers insights. It's nice to have data. We have a lot of data around us. I'm interested by smart data, which are giving me the insights I need. We need to surprise our customers with those insights. It is going to impact the human behavior. So I hope when you're going to leave the room now, just after my conference, you're going to go to these sanitizers. I promise to AWS analytics team that there will be a peak of consumption after my conference. So don't put me wrong. Just do it. It's going to change the human behavior. And this is fantastic. 
because it's about people. I am in a people business. It's about protecting you, pleasing you, surprising you. So ladies and gentlemen, in all these success stories, there is a magic recipe called partnership, partnership which matters, and we are reimagining the future of hygiene and cleaning. Thanks a lot to AWS, and do remember, clean and wash your hands. Thank you. That's awesome. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm really honored to have you here. So to conclude, actually, I, uh, what's best and uh, what uh, Ilham just said about uh, the importance of uh, partnering. We're really launching an ecosystem. And the ecosystem of partners around us uh, today that are making this possible also includes some of the leading uh, uh, hardware manufacturers. You can see here I have boards from uh, 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 leading manufacturers such as Intel, Marvel, Broadcom, and, uh, and MediaTek, and Texas Instruments. What I'm holding in my hands is an is, is a incredible uh, uh, device from MediaTek that contains a GPS, a GPRS connectivity, Wi-Fi. It's all out of the box. It's all connected through AWS, uh, through the AWS SDK. So really my message to you is today you can actually buy most of the kits on Amazon.com. You can start creating. You can actually start uh, embarking into a journey of transformation to the world, to actually make it a better place like we've seen from some of the great partners we had today. So thanks a lot. Please do not miss the next session. I really hope you enjoyed this one. And please go build and go create some stuff.